Okay, this video is part of a series I've been working on on Wednesdays. There should be an annotation on the screen to the full playlist. And today we are creating our first script in Python 3. So far we've been working within the actual interpreter, uh, but today we're going to create a script. But there's a few things you need to know when you're creating a script, uh, regardless of, well, mostly regardless of what language it is, whether it's, it's Perl or Python or Bash is that um, different operating systems look at scripts differently. Regardless of what language it is, if it's a script, it's, it's going to be a plain text file. It's a text file. That's all it is. Now, Unix-based and Unix-like operating systems, such as Linux, uh, BSD, um, well, I guess BSD was a derivative of Unix. Anyway, without getting into that. Um, they don't care too much about extensions. They're smart and can look at the code, look at the, the file, and determine what type of file it is, whether it's a binary file or an ASCII file, a plain text file, um, or an image file, or a music file, a WAV file. Uh, extensions, for the most part, like .jpg, .png, or in this case, .py, are more there for the user to know, so they can quickly look at it and go, oh, it's that type of file. That being said, it can detect whether it's a plain text file, but how does it know what type of plain text, what type of script it is? It knows it's a script if you make it executable, which we'll get into in a moment, but the way it knows what type of script and what interpreter it needs to use, because you're writing Python script, you need the Python interpreter. If you're writing in Perl, you need the Perl interpreter. If you're writing in Bash, you need the Bash interpreter. And then you also have Python 2 and Python 3. Which interpreter should it use? Well, that's the shebang line. That is the first line of your code. Uh, and it should always be the first line of your code. Um, now, I see a lot of people, especially when they're asking me questions about their code, they go, they show me, they share their code, and they don't have the shipping line, and it drives me crazy, because it doesn't have to be there. I can start the code different ways. I can start it by running it, and the interpreter, the, the, my operating system will run whatever interpreter the shebang line says, but if that shebang line isn't there, it doesn't know what interpreter, so I could also start it up with Python. We'll go over this in a moment. And on a Windows machine, the Windows machine doesn't care about the shebang line because it goes by the file extension. Uh, a Windows machine um, doesn't care about a file having permission to execute. Um, it basically, uh, if, if it has an extension, it can run. If it has an extension of exe, it will run as an exe. If it has an extension of py, if you have Python installed, it will run as Python. Uh, which is one of the v many, many very uh, insecurities of a Windows operating system. Um, but we're not even going to get into that debate. Um, but it is. I mean, uh, files that are, are scripts that are possibly executable files shouldn't be allowed to run until the user or the administrator, the root uh, user, or whoever has the permissions to give that program permission to run, give it permission to run. Um, so take, keep those in mind. Uh, in a Unix and Unix-like operating system such as Linux, you don't have to have the extension PY, but if you're going to be sending it, you want Windows users to use it, you're going to put that extension on there just so they can run it. They can still run, they can rename it, or they can start it up in Python with uh, the, and the other way around. If you're on a Windows machine, go ahead, put the dot .py, but also put the shebang line. There's no reason not to do it because it just makes your code easier for the end user to use. Yes, again, if you don't put the shebang line, which I'll show you here in a second, uh, they can still start it off by running Python, but it's annoying to have to type out Python, Python 3, and I'd have to know, you know, even though it has PY, which, which PY is it? Is it Python 3 or Python 2? Your shebang line should tell you that. So anyway, I'm going to use Vim as my text editor, but use whatever text editor you like. Um, and I'm going to call my script... Right now, just to let you know, I'll show you. I'm in a folder. There's nothing in this folder. I just tried listing the files. There's nothing in there. I'm going to say vim. I'll call this mycode.py. Whoops. And then I'm going to say the first line here is my shebang line. And it starts pound uh, exclamation mark. Then we're going to say forward slash 
USR forward slash BIN forward slash ENV. Okay, this is saying use this interpreter and it's saying look in this folder, in this folder, and look at the environment uh, executable. And which environment are we going to use? We're going to say Python 3. And we're doing that because if you just put Python, it's going to use whatever the default Python interpreter is, which on most systems is going to be Python 2 point something. And we're working with Python 3 here. So be specific uh, would probably be a good, good idea. Uh, so regardless of what operating system you're on, you should put that line there. Because if you come and ask me a question and you share your code and it doesn't have that, it, the first thing I'm going to tell you is put that in there. Just do it. <laughs> okay, so things we've learned in previous tutorials, we've learned how to display uh, information to the screen, how to retrieve information from a user, put it into a variable, save it to a file, um, read that file, and we've learned how to check if the file exists and we're able to access it, and if we can do something, if we can't do something else. So we're gonna put all that together today in about, I'd say about 10 lines of code. So. Uh, we're going to start off with try. So the, the script, what it's going to do is it's going to check. Does the, we'll say, name.log file exist? If it does, read it and retrieve the username from there. And then print out hello, whatever the username is. If the file does not exist, then we want to retrieve that from the user and save it to the file. So next time they run the script, they don't have to re-enter their username or username or regular name, whatever you want to call it. So we're going to say try this. So the first thing we're going to try, we're going to say try. We're going to say create a file object. F is our object. We're going to say open and we'll name the file name.log, which as I showed you earlier, does not exist quite yet. And we're going to open it for reading. And then we're going to say, okay, the contents of the file, we're going to put that into a variable called name. So, and the only thing that should be in that file is the name, which we'll show you how we get that information in a moment. Now that we've got it, we've put it into a variable, we can say close, or sorry, f.close, and then our parentheses like so. Okay, great. So we retrieved the name, put it in the variable, and closed it. We could put our print hello and the username in here as well. We could put it on the next line, but if that file doesn't exist, we're going to ask the user for their name and then print hello and their name after storing it to a file. So regardless of whether we can this file exists or doesn't, we're going to be printing that line. So there's no reason to put that twice. Here, I'll, I'll show you what I'm saying because I'm not sure if explaining it. What I can do is I can say hello space plus name. Now, I, also, I'll get into this in a future tutorial. I put the space there because we're using the plus sign here. There's actually another option that I haven't mentioned yet, but uh, we'll get into that later. So we're saying, hello name. So we've opened the file, got the username, and we said hello name. Now, what if that file doesn't exist or we're unable to access it for some reason? We can say, as we learned in the last tutorial, accept IO error, colon, and now remember, I'm indenting here. This is important, again, because Python does not use uh, braces or brackets or anything to indicate the statement. It goes by indentation. So the code it forces you to type clean code. So this is saying if for some reason we're unable to open that file, whether it doesn't exist or we don't have permission to, we're going to say uh, do this instead. So right now the file doesn't exist. So this first portion here, this first time we run the code, it's not gonna. It's not gonna work. Uh, so now we're gonna say, open name dot log, just as we did earlier. But this time we're gonna open it to write to it, and this is where the creation of the file is coming from. Then we're gonna say, just like before, we're gonna create a name variable. But the name variable, we're instead of getting it from the file, we're gonna get it from the user, and we're gonna say, give them a prompt here, just as we've shown in previous tutorials. Uh, please enter your whoop, name colon space okay so now we've got the user whatever the user types on the keyboard and we put it in the variable name 
let's write it to the file so it's saved. So next time they run this program, this script of ours, they, don't, they aren't asked for it again because we already have it. So we're writing it to the file. Then we're going to say uh, file.close. And here we can say the same thing. Here I'm just going to paste that there. And as I mentioned in a previous tutorial, I just highlight that and center click on uh, Unix and Unix-like operating systems such as Linux. Uh, most of the time, once you highlighted something, it's copied and you can paste it by center clicking. Um, so we did that, but you know, this line of code is the same as this line of the code, so there's no need to have that in there twice. So what I'm going to do is instead of having it in there twice, put it after both statements, that line, because it doesn't matter. It's, it's going to either try this, open the file, if the file exists, read the file, close it, and then it's going to skip all this and print hello name. But if there's a problem reading that file, most likely due to it not existing uh, in this particular case, well then we're, we're not going to do any of this. We're going to skip that and come down here, open the file to write, get the username, write it to the file, close it, and then print it out based on the variable. And we name the variable the same in both places. I'm going to save this. Okay, so we've created the file. We've given it the extension .py. Even though I'm running on Linux, I don't need that. I do that so that Windows users are a little bit easier uh, for them to, to run it. And I put the shebang line so it's easier for Linux users and other Unix based. Basically, every other operating system other than Windows is able to uh, run it without having a type in. See, without that shebang line, I'd have to type python3 mycode.py. And I could actually run it like that right now. See, I'll hit enter, it runs, and it's asked me to enter my name. Please enter your name. Uh, I'll enter Chris, I'll hit enter, and it says hello Chris. If I run it again, I hit up arrow to go back to the last command, python3 mycode.py, I hit it again. It doesn't ask me for my name, it just says hello Chris because it got it from our file. See, the file exists here. I can display what's inside that file uh, right there with Chris. So I ran it without making it executable because I'm running Python 3, which is executable, uh, which is very different than running the code directly. Uh, can't just This code can't run by itself just by clicking on it or calling it with a dot slash unless you make it executable. Uh, this is to prevent programs from getting on your system and just running or having a user, you know, they click on a file on a website, it downloads, and you say run, and yeah, you know, are you sure you want to run this? Uh, yeah, I downloaded it, let me run it. You know, it's, it's, it's just one step that's, that can't, you know, you have to be in control of. So what you normally would want to do is change mod plus X, and then the name of the file. Now this program is executable. I should have, should, should have shown you before I made it executable. Actually, let's do change mod minus x. I just removed executable. So if I do dot slash and I try to autocomplete, it's not going to work because since I'm doing dot slash, it's looking for an executable file, which this is not. But I can say dot slash, which is saying look for this program in this directory. That's what the dot slash means. If you actually built an installer for this, it would be installed to uh, a path that you have uh, that you can execute from anywhere. Uh, on a Unix-based system, it's commonly the USR uh, bin folder on a Windows machine. Uh, well, they have their program files folder, which doesn't work like that, which is a little confusing to me. Um, but they do have their uh, inside their Windows folder, their System32 and their System folder. And that's where if files are put in there, they should be able to be executed from anywhere without having them put in the full path name. Why the program files folder isn't like that is uh, interesting. Anyway, um, so I do dot slash, it says permission denied because we didn't make it executable. So change mod plus x, oops, space plus x. And you only have to do that once. It's like that. But now if I was to email this file to someone, transferring it through the email, it will lose or if I put it on a website, it will lose its executable. So when someone downloads it, they have to make it executable again so it can't just run um, with a, just a click, you know? Uh, so I already did that. So now I can do dot slash, and when I tab to complete it, it auto-completed because it sees it as an executable. And now I can hit enter, and you see it ran again. And again, if I remove the name.log file, and run it again this time, since that file no longer exists, it's going to ask me for my name again. I'll say Chris. I'll hit enter and it says hello Chris and now if I run it again it's, 
it's doing again. Now again, we're, we're saving it to the folder that we're, we're currently working out of. If you're really doing this, you would create a config folder somewhere that would store all the information for your, uh, for your, your code, normally in the home directory as a hidden folder. Um, but just as, this is just an example code. Uh, because if I was to move to a different folder, if I did have this installed to a system path, such as a uh, USR bin, and I went to a different folder, uh, and I ran it, it would look for that name.log file in the folder I'm in, and it wouldn't exist, and it would create a new one there. And every folder I run that program in would create another. So it all depends on what you're trying to do, but normally if you're saving inform information for uh, your program, you're going to have config files somewhere. Um, so let's uh, yeah, quickly review everything we've talked about. Most operating systems, the .py doesn't matter. That's pretty much every operating system except for Windows. On Windows, you need the .py for it to run, or you need to run Python and the program. Basically, on Windows, it knows when there's .py to run it through Python. In Linux, it knows by the shebang line, which is the or any Unix-based oper Unix-like or Unix-based like uh, Unix like operating systems such as Linux or Unix-based Unix operating systems such as BSD uh, is going to look for the shebang line. And again, this is the best route here um, because this is telling it to use Python 3 where if I didn't have that and I just ran it through Python, if the default Python interpreter was in Python 3, that would cause a problem. Um, so the shebang line is definitely the most efficient way to do that. Um, so you definitely want to have that and uh, suggested having the .py. Uh, unless you're creating a different installers for stuff and you don't want to put the .py for your installer for Unix-based operating systems and on a Windows machine you would because you're gonna, if you're going to make an installer, you're going to have to make an installer different even though the code, this program right now will work on a Windows machine, a Mac machine, a Linux machine, an Android machine. Um, you would still need to make some sort of installer unless the user is going to download the code and set it up themselves. That's the hardest part about programming is the installer and I did a short, very short series on all the different options out there for different operating systems. It's kind of a pain but here you go. Uh, that's our tutorial for today. We made our first script which incorporated everything we've learned so far. Printing stuff to the screen, reading stuff, getting user for information from the user, opening files to read them, open files to writing them, and uh, so that's it. I hope that you enjoyed this tutorial. I hope that the whole, uh, you know, if you're coming from an operating system, Windows, that doesn't uh, really have file permissions in this aspect, um, most operating systems have since the 70s, you know, Unix-like operating systems and Unix-based operating systems, which are most operating systems out there, um, have had file permissions since then. Uh, Windows didn't even incorporate any type of real file permissions until uh, about the year 2000, somewhere around there. Um, and even since they've done that, it's, it's completely different than, than most operating systems. And then mobile operating systems are are even if they are Linux based such as Android um, they have weird ways they do their file permissions as well in some aspects the core of the operating ah, see now I'm getting off on a rant okay so I hope you enjoyed this tutorial I hope you learned something about how important the shebang line is uh, and how important uh, the extensions are and how important they're not depending on your situation uh, why you should use a shebang line why file permissions are important and also how to put your code into a file that can be executed. So I thank you for watching. Please visit filmsbychris.com. That's Chris with a K. There's a link in the description to my website where you can search through my videos, playlists, and also links uh, once you go to my site to get to things such as uh, my Google Plus page, my Facebook page, uh, and my Twitter account. So I recommend uh, checking those out, subscribing, liking if you are enjoying these tutorials. I got plenty more to come. And I just hope you keep watching and I hope that you have a great day. See you next Wednesday if you're watching these as I'm putting them out. Thank you.